one of the original female-driven cop dramas on TV, Charlie's Angels. But something happened in the 2000s where this formula stopped working and it only got worse. Was it the number of angels? Are three women leads just too much for a TV show? Has Hollywood just not found the right balance of camp and drama? Or is the formula now just out of fashion? So I was reminded that Charlie's Angels was a TV show in the 70s, and I immediately thought, oh, it's that show that they tried to revive in movie form a few years ago that apparently bombed. But wait, wasn't the show pretty popular? Yeah. Wasn't those movies from the 2000s pretty popular as well? Well, yeah, I guess. Well, what happened? This formula of flipping the roles of the action hero to the woman usually works, but something's different now. But to understand our present, we have to go back to the past. It's the end of the golden age of television. Around the late 1960s to early 70s, more experimental shows were coming out and society was evolving along with our entertainment. Campy fantasy comedies like Batman were very popular. And in the 70s, there was a boom in action media. Martial arts was big and more independent films were popping up, including adult entertainment. More women in general were getting more screen time. And all of this was connected to the rise of a movement happening known as the second wave of feminism. Feminism has come in four different waves, basically one for each generation. The second wave basically lasted from the 60s through the 80s, and this wave called for more gender equality in the workplace, reproduction rights, and the freedom to express themselves more sexually. There are many pros and cons to this movement. A lot of questionable choices were made in the name of entertainment, but this period was very experimental, and one thing would inspire another. In this time of cheesy action movies and female empowerment, a TV producer and writer team came up with the idea for Charlie's Angels. They were two buddies who often worked together in the industry, and they based this idea off the success of a police drama called Police Woman. And with a title like that, it shouldn't surprise you that Police Woman was the first hour-long drama to star a woman as a police officer. Police Woman was a success on NBC, and at the time of development for Charlie's Angels, Police Woman had already been on air for about two years. So the creators of Angels wanted to do Police Woman times three, without the constraints of being actual police. I assume they wanted the Angels to be private investigators in order to have more freedom to move and dress the way they wanted to. The question is, did they want this for women progression in TV or did they want this for themselves and the other men who'd be watching? There was an emphasis on the private eye angels being beautiful. Now by 20th century entertainment logic, even though the show was meant to be a fantasy, a woman running a private investigation service without a man behind them just wouldn't be believable. So the man running everything is named Charles Townsend, and he's never on camera. It doesn't matter what he looks like. But the premise is that this mysterious man behind this private investigation agency saw that these three women were given these boring law enforcement jobs like meter maid and office worker after they graduated from the police academy. It's all explained in the intro's condescending yet charming tone. Once upon a time, there were three little girls who went to the police academy. But I took them away from all that, and now they work for me. They never actually meet Charles. Through this other guy who works for him, Bosley, Charles works with the angels from home or whatever. If they do show Charlie on screen, they won't show his face and he'll be doing something leisurely while he talks to them on the phone. How did you hurt your back? The crushing weight of responsibility, Angel. But I think it'll just be a matter of some deft manipulation before I'll be standing as erect as ever. There's a lot you can analyze from the premise alone. Like has this man Charlie been spying on these women from the moment they entered the police academy? Why is he so secretive with his identity? Were these the only women on the force who were forced to work lame jobs? Why didn't he recruit the other women? Why is he always lying? Why are they so okay with how sketchy this is? Is Charlie just a simp or just some kind of high-end pimp? I mean, given the time period and the premise, there's just so many questions, but the creators mentioned that this was some form of escapism. It's a fantasy, a man's fantasy. 
This was the same time period where Playboy was big business. We all know about Hugh Hefner and how he recruited women to live with him in his mansion for 50 years of his life, all in the name of entertainment and women's empowerment. And the idea of Charlie's angels wasn't much different from Hughes bunnies. But this all goes into the general pros and cons list of the second wave feminist movement, where they allowed women to be as free as they wanted as long as the men were satisfied. I'll get into that later. But Charlie's Angels wasn't really that sketchy at all. It was a nice idea for a TV show, and it lasted from fall of 1976 to late spring of 1981 for a total of five seasons. The show was really an iconic part of the feminist movement and an important part of television history. That's history right there, you understand? Angels and Policewoman was the proof that women could hold down a successful TV show outside of comedy and would help form the groundwork for women's roles in the future. Even though people probably just thought the show was a cute fantasy, Charlie's Angels was done in a realistic procedural drama format. Like the police dramas of today, each episode was around 45 minutes and played out as crime is committed, lead characters investigate, and crime is resolved. For a millennial or younger who never actually saw the original TV show airing and grew up with the two movies, the tone of the original might take you by surprise. I actually expected the show to be kind of comedic like a lot of the TV shows before it, when it was actually more of a classy undercover drama that had a a light-hearted layer of humor to it. A lot of the cheesiness was probably on accident. At the time, they probably thought it was just being clever or funny. The ABC network thought the idea for Charlie's Angels wouldn't work and no one would watch it. As depicted in the made-for-TV movie from 2004, behind the camera, the unauthorized story of Charlie's Angels, the producer who actually pitched it was told by an ABC executive that it was one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. Another exec claimed no one would ever watch it, but luckily one of the executives leave and is replaced by one who will actually approve to shoot the pilot. The pilot itself had high Nielsen ratings, much to the network's surprise. So there was a formula made in the 70s based on a TV marketing strategy where the sexual appeal of the female leads would be emphasized for the mostly male intended audience. By Japanese media terms, this would be called fan service. Eventually, we would realize that this was just men making TV for men, and everything was under the male gaze. It would be rightfully criticized and adjusted over the years. The 70s is when this all started on a mainstream scale, and it was quite raw. Pornography was finding a way to seep into the mainstream as society progressed, and there was indeed panic and anxiety happening over porn getting into our everyday television. But regulations and censorship did exist, and while the rules of what could be broadcasted were always laid out, the rules would be bent a little every now and then. This format based on the male gaze wasn't meant to be taken seriously. You'd see it in fantasy shows like Wonder Woman or comedies like Three's Company. This is probably why ABC thought Charlie's Angels would do poorly, but Charlie's Angels wasn't following the old format. It was doing something different. Different. It was actually doing something positive for the feminist movement, showing very capable women without reducing them to an object or punchline, but it was still under that male gaze. These are the pros and cons of the second wave of feminism. Charlie's Angels incorporated everything that made the 70s what it was in media. You'll see the female empowerment, but also you see that the characters don't always wear bras. This is honestly pretty shocking to see today that it would be allowed on TV, but when you look back on how well the show did, going from the number three show to number one, it's more obvious that a lot of viewers weren't just tuning in for the story. Again, the 60s started the second feminist movement, and one of the main events of that decade were the protests involving women burning their bras. This sense of liberation evolved into 70s film and TV. You started seeing more nipples through shirts, more loose clothing, and more skin. It seemed like a win-win situation for those who wanted to look and those who wanted to be seen. It's all connected. Despite having mixed reviews, some thought it was just more boob TV and some actually enjoyed it for what it was, it was widely popular and the first two seasons were in the top 10 highest rated shows. Like with many TV icons, there was merchandise. And despite being a show for people over 14, there were numerous toys and collectibles and Hasbro was creating most of it. Farrah Fawcett's 1976 red bathing suit poster became the best selling poster in history, which definitely helped the Charlie's Angels popularity even though it had nothing to do with it. The show was quite popular across the pond in the UK as well. They had a thing for publishing books and comics based on popular TV brands. 
as B, C, D, E, F, G, and Z movies starring women would help to inspire women-led TV shows, Charlie's Angels would inspire its own film ripoffs. But unlike the TV show, these were definitely not meant to be taken too seriously. The subgenre Girls with Guns became more of a thing around this time. During the show run, two of the angels had to be switched out with new ones, mainly Farrah and Kate Jackson's character. But they kept the show going that way. I think this was played off by saying the angels were interchangeable. If one wanted to leave, another qualified angel would take her place. Eventually, they would get a new group all together. After the eventual cancellation in 1981, it goes into syndication with over 110 episodes. The influence of Charlie's Angels, the women-led police drama, and the second wave feminist movement had spread across the globe. In Japan during the 80s, you could see a rise in female-led action comedies that usually star women in law enforcement roles of some kind. In the anime Dirty Pair, the codename for the two protagonists was the Lovely Angels. Maybe just a coincidence, maybe not, but Charlie's Angels was definitely one of the first shows to use this format. In America, the format would continue while they turned down the subjectiveness with shows like Cagney and Lassie or Cagney and Lacey. And given how Cagney and Lassie lasted even longer than Charlie's Angels did with seven seasons, you gotta wonder what did they do right to keep it going? Maybe it was a numbers thing. Two detectives is somehow better than three. This can be proven in a lot of media during this time as buddy cop stories were wildly successful. A lot of the best film and TV really had that dynamic duo aspect. Maybe using three was only best used for a TV comedy because of that comedy rule of three. You had the three stooges, three's company, but Charlie's Angels wasn't a comedy. Like maybe if the show only starred Jacqueline Smith and Kate Jackson, or just Kate Jackson and Farrah Fawcett, and they actually stayed on the show, I expect Charlie's Angels would have lasted even longer. Well, even though the show had been canceled, it was still buzzing with syndicated popularity, and the influence was still there. So in the late 1980s, there was an attempt at a reboot series. The same production company to get the OG show off the ground did a talent search for what was going to be called Angels 88. The Chosen Angels would feature several new faces, including Tia Leone. The pilot apparently did not get picked up since no one saw it. But you know how they pick the shows on TV, right? Well, the way they pick TV shows is they make one show. That show's called a pilot. Then they show that one show to the people who pick shows. And on the strength of that one show, they decide if they want to make more shows. Some get chosen and become television programs. Some don't become nothing. She starred in one of the ones that became nothing. Maybe it was too soon for a reboot, but as the 80s ended and the 90s began, the feminist movement had evolved again, like a Pokemon, into its third wave. It was a new era of entertainment, and the 21st century was right around the corner. So a brand new take on the angels was made in the form of a big budget action movie. Cameron Diaz, Drew Barrymore, and Lucy Liu were the new Charlie's Angels of this generation. As the movie served as the legit continuation of the Charlie Townsend agency. While doing great in the box office, the critics would call it out on its lack of originality on Rotten Tomatoes. Roger Ebert called it a movie without a brain, giving it a half a star. Years later, it would be called out on all the problematic elements it had. But to its defense, it was a product of its time. Movies without a brain were common in the early 2000s. Seems like sex and shock appeal would take priority over story and realism. Spy Kids was a thing during this time. The second Angels movie came out in 2003, full throttle. It did more to pay tribute to the original show and had Jacqueline Smith make a cameo as an original angel. With a larger budget, it actually did just as good as its predecessor, more or less, with the same kind of criticism, except this time Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 5.1. But Roger Ebert gave it a 2.5 after admitting it was at least enjoyable. There was an idea to continue the film series in 2004, but it was canceled. But again, the influence of Charlie's Angels was global and the movies would only add to its popularity. Telemundo made their own Spanish version of the show in the late 90s called Angeles. Although it was soon canceled because Hispanic viewers didn't take to the long nightly format, they were used to watching telenovelas at that time. Other countries would try their hand at Charlie's Angels as well around the time the movies were coming out. There was a German version known in English as Three Wild Angels, and with two seasons, this was arguably the most successful Charlie's Angels TV reboot to be made. Around the same time, America had made a show called She Spies. Oh. 
are three career criminals with one shot at freedom. Now they're working for the feds who put them away. These are the women of She Spies. Bad girls gone good. It started out to be more humorous than its TV counterparts, but changed in season two. It still didn't reach a season three though. None of the Charlie's Angels remakes did. There was even a Taiwanese attempt called Asian Charlie's Angels. I'm not even kidding, but apparently it was a pain to watch. Charlie's Angels was often imitated and parodied during this time in the early 2000s. You'd have to wonder if the imitations were based on the new movies or based on the 70s show, because now you could tell an obvious difference between the two. Is there an empowering message to be shared or is it just a big joke? If the Charlie's Angels concept wasn't being taken too seriously in the 70s, then the 2000s version didn't do too much to improve that image. The live action attempts were coming to a screeching halt as it seemed that there were limits to what they could do with this concept. But in animation, the Spy Girls concept was kind of blowing up. Charlie's Angels The Animated Adventures, which sounds like a computer game from 2000, was a web series in 2003. It was six episodes meant to bridge the events of the live action movies. But the best example of the Charlie's Angels formula in animation was Totally Spies. You could see early seasons of it dubbed in America, but apparently it's a French made cartoon so basically it continued airing mostly in France and Canada. It lasted for six seasons over the course of 12 or 13 years and it was actually recently revived for a seventh season. Spy cartoons were just good business, especially if it featured heroines. It was all a part of the progress for more female inclusion on an equal, less male gazing basis. And there wasn't a huge merchandise boom for the certified Charlie's Angels brand like it was for the original TV show. It was mostly in the form of video games, DVD and VHS sales, and eventually Blu-rays. Studios deciding not to go through with more Charlie's movies was probably a bullet dodged because by the end of the 2000s, media had completely changed. Digital video had taken hold and there was all this bonus footage out there from the DVD releases. Videos were streaming and audiences would be reminded of all the good and the bad that came with the Charlie's Angels legacy up until then. The time of campy action flicks was pretty much over. I mean, you still had Michael Bay movies, but at least by this time, he was doing something different with it. Well, as we move into the 2010s, there was another remake attempt for Charlie's Angels in 2011. This was a straight up modern day American remake, except this time it took place in Miami. It was meant to be taken seriously. No camp, no major eye candy, just real emotionally grounded characters. ABC ordered a whole season, but they pulled the plug on it after only four episodes aired, apparently for low ratings. ABC was the network to air the original series, and this was an honest attempt to breathe life back into the franchise, but even ABC couldn't revive this for modern day television. And that says a lot. But the 2011 revival attempt did receive mostly negative reviews, and in this new age with the blow up of social media, the critique was very public. Don't believe the Twitter users? Rotten Tomatoes has it at a 0%. An article for NPR called it a project no one loves, and a writer had it on his worst TV I watched in 2011 list. He made an interesting point that the grim, serious take robbed whatever campy, cheesy fun you might have expected from the brand name. That's the problem right there. People are always expecting Charlie's Angels to be extra, and nothing cemented this idea more than the movies did. The movies were still fresh in people's heads, and they seemed to have forgotten about how the original show was actually just a regular cop drama with a huge twist to it. And if it worked before, it could work again. But realistic cop dramas seemed to be what everyone wanted, as cop dramas were doing just fine, especially with the long-running Law & Order series. And female inclusion and empowerment was no longer even an issue. We had plenty of believable female characters in shows coming up like Rizzolian Isles. Rizzolian Isles did very well in the ratings and followed the the two female cop format, much like that show from the 80s, Cagney and Lassie. Also, as third wave feminism was going into its fourth current generation, having a campy TV show about three pretty cops might be seen as offensive for some. Female detectives on TV are great, but now they need to be on equal terms with the men. Detective Olivia Benson from Law & Order SVU is currently the captain of the Special Victims Unit, and the show is still going strong, uh, more or less. And even though I'm sure there are some people who have a problem with it, this is the type of TV evolution the viewers want. Unless they somehow make Charlie Townsend a woman, I doubt we'll see any more attempts at an Angels TV show. 
And that brings me to the film revival of 2019. The most recent version of Charlie's Angels was actually written and directed by Elizabeth Banks. Now, Elizabeth Banks has proven over time to be more than just an actress. She owns a production company, produced the Pitch Perfect movies, and is the current host of ABC's game show, Press Your Luck. The film would be the first big Charlie's Angels release to be made by a woman. It was meant to be a legitimate continuation of the OG show and the movies from the 2000s. It would even reveal at the end of the movie that the original Angel from the 70s, Jacqueline Smith's character, would become the new Charlie while made with the best intentions. Charlie's Angels 2019 had mixed reviews and a poor opening weekend box office. It had some minor competition, but as an action movie, it still underperformed. The Hollywood Reporter would observe that the film failed to attract moviegoers over the age of 35, which means that Charlie's Angels 2019 couldn't get the attention of the original fan base. The Hollywood Reporter article would suggest the problem is that it's writing on an old IP and that Hollywood is forcing it on the public when its time is already up. That the film's fatal flaw was that Sony, the distributor, didn't understand that star power is what made the original films work. One critic would claim that the plot was overly complicated, and another would say it was out of style. Out of style, unfortunately, seems to be the verdict of the Charlie's Angels brand. In other words, it didn't age well. Looking back now to the 70s, they had a good idea, but it was overshadowed by the male gaze. In the 2000s, it was overshadowed by special effects, lack of realism, and the male gaze. Now, if you attempt to take out all the things that made it work with audiences, even if what made it work was problematic, what do you have? Today's society is simply not willing to accept a live-action, realistic, modern-day Charlie's Angels. Charlie's Angels can only exist as a fantasy and as a memory. If it's not over-the-top, campy, or low-key sexual, it's not Charlie's Angels. If the point was to show that women can do whatever James Bond and Ethan Hunt can do, they pretty much did it. But the trade-off is that it can't be taken seriously. It is escapism from the usual escapism. If today's Hollywood wants to make an action movie starring women, they can do that just fine. There's modern movies like Ocean's 8 and Hustlers that take a more realistic approach, and they have star power. But whatever they do, it can't use the Charlie's Angels formula. Three girls looking hot and kicking butt just doesn't cut it anymore unless it's pure comedy or in a cartoon. Otherwise, you might get something like The 355, an action spy thriller that starred five women and ended up underperforming in that box office with negative critic reviews, even though it was entertaining for the audience. You could say that this concept only existed in the first place because men wanted to see it. But in the end, each version of Charlie's Angels was a product of their time, as well as a vehicle for progress in media. If you made it this far, I want to thank you for watching. Help me out by liking and commenting and subscribing for more random nostalgia and interesting coincidences surrounding said nostalgia. And I will see ya.